a wet time. The land is an ark full of things waiting. Underfoot it goes temporary and soft, tracks filling with water as the foot is raised. The fields sodden go free of plans. Hands become obscure in their use, prehistoric. The mind passes over changed surfaces like a boat, drawn to the thought of roofs and to the thought of swimming and wading birds. Along the river, croplands and gardens are buried in the flood, airy places grown dark and silent beneath it. Under the slender branch holding the new nest of the hummingbird, the river flows heavy with earth, the water turned the color of broken slopes. I stand deep in the mud of the shore, like a stake planted to measure the rise, the water rising, the earth falling to meet it. A great cottonwood passes down, the leaves shivering as the roots drag the bottom. I turn like an ancient worshiper to the thought of solid ground. I was not ready for this parting my native land putting out to sea. Now, of course, The human history of these places is not always ideal. This poem is a little reminder. This is a Kentucky River bottom poem, although I don't think it says so. The Grandmother. Better born than married, misled, in the heavy summers of the river bottom and the long winters cut off by snow, she would crave gentle, dainty things, a pretty little cookie, or a cup of tea, but spent her days over a wood stove cooking cornbread, kittles of joel and beans for the heavy, hungry, hard-handed men she had married and mothered, bent, past unbending by her days of labor that love had led her to. They had to break her before she would lie down in her coffin. The heron. I should say, I'm not making lots of explanatory comments or something. I reckon that you should feel perfectly free, if if you want to, to ask me to explain something. <coughs> if, I mean, they're clear to me. <laughs> A little green heron. A shite poke. The heron. While the summer's growth kept me anxious and planted rose, I forgot the river where it flowed, faithful to its way, beneath the slope where my household has taken its laborious stand. I could not reach it even in dreams. But one morning, at the summer's end, I remember it again, as though its being lifts into mine in undeniable flood, and I carry my boat down through the fog, over the rocks, and set out. I go easy and silent, and the warblers appear among the leaves of the willows, their flight like gold thread, quick in the live tapestry of the leaves. And I go on until I see crouched on a dead branch sticking out of the water a heron, so still that I believe he is a bit of drift, hung dead above the water. And then I see the articulation of feather and living eye, a brilliance I receive beyond my power to make, as he receives in his great patience the river's providence. And then I see that I am seen, admitted, 
my silence accepted in his silence. Still as I keep, I might be a tree for all the fear he shows. Suddenly I know I have passed across to a shore where I do not live. 